Hi, everyone, and welcome to episode 337 of the Tick Bootcamp podcast. The title of today's interview is Living in My Purpose, an interview with Tanya Miller. My name's Tiara Smith. And I'm Richard Johannesson. And today we're going to talk with Tanya about how her Lyme journey helped her discover her purpose and advocacy for chronic illnesses, how she became an advocate for herself, medically speaking, and how she became resourceful in creating an apparel line that stemmed off of her experience with Lyme disease. Without further ado, we're really excited to introduce to you, Tanya J. Miller. Awesome. Well, hi, Tanya. Thank you so much for joining us. It's a pleasure to have you. Hi, Sierra. Happy to be here. I'm excited. I really am. So looking forward to the combo. Definitely. We're definitely excited to, to hear from you um, and for you to be here on the podcast. And so first and foremost, welcome. Uh, and second, um, we would love to hear more about you, right? Um, so tell us where, where do you reside? Um, let's start there. Absolutely. So um, my husband and I are back home in um, Texas. We're in a uh, suburb of Dallas, but Basically, if you say the Dallas-Fort Worth Metroplex, you catch all of the cities in the round Darrow part. But um, we came back from Virginia a little while ago, but uh, I'm, I guess if you want to do some deep history, I am uh, one of eight children with my dad, and then I am second of four with just my mom and my dad. I have tons of nieces and nephews. I can't count them. I don't remember their names. And that was before Lyme. (laughs) I'm not their names. I don't remember their birthdays and stuff. That was before Lyme. But, um, you know, my family, especially my mom's side, we're very uh, family-oriented, close-knit. And a lot of people are surprised by that because there's, like, a a lot of us, like, a couple of hundred at every family gets together and then you throw in a family reunion it's even more than that but um I brought that up to say my family is why I'm here and so um I'll let you throw me another question or ask me some more about them or wherever we want to I want to make sure I'm I'm bobbing and weaving in the right way that we want to go today <laughs> yeah I like that Bob and we even I um I think it's great that you're very very close to your family especially with the bigger family at that and I know um kind of with the Lyme journey right like having that familial support is absolutely everything X. <laughs> <laughs> if it wasn't for them um just a lot of them just stepping up and you know doing things caring praying sending if it the older people are like, baby, I sent you five dollars on the on that cash app. Is that all right? I hope the five dollars <laughs> helped. Yeah, look, whatever you send me, Amy, I'm good with. So, yes, uh, family has definitely um, been great in this this journey. I call it my Lyme Lyme journey. God glory story is what I call it. I love that. I, you know what? I haven't necessarily heard too many people uh, name their journey, so I think that that's amazing. Yeah, it's I have amazing. my three names. Lime journey, God glory, um, no lime, please. And then this year I called it uh, uh, hell no lime. That's what I called it. <laughs> so, I, I got I, 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 I think about where I'm at in the process, and I speak, I speak about it, and so yeah, um, it's a journey. But oh it's, yeah, um, we're, I think we, we're equipped with, you know, if that makes sense. Yeah, the words make all the difference, right? In terms of how we claim it, how we process it. So I commend you on coming up with multiple alternatives <laughs> to cater to your feelings about it. Um, I'd love to kind of get a little bit into your story and kind of see um, how did things start for you, right? Um, I think it's always very interesting because everyone's story is so immensely different. So yeah. I'd love to hear how did things start as far as the initial recognition of perhaps like maybe something is not right, um, which is probably the toughest part of, of, of the whole thing is just trying to figure out what's going on. So could you tell me a little bit about that? Yeah. So I probably got sick the wrong time because I got the, I was pretty much I started feeling symptoms um, about October, November of 2019. And 
I was already a person that battled chronic illness before I have endometriosis. And so at first, I thought that's what was going on. So I was like, hey, you know, am I, you know, do I have some cysts? Do I have a fibroid or tumor or something? Like, I'm, we're trying to figure that out and go down that path. But then something crazy happened, y'all. Um, I started to fall. Like, just, I would be wild kid. Pip, just fall. Just, just, my legs would go out. Like, I said, well, no, that, that, that can't be endometriosis because that wouldn't really make sense. Um, and so that's when I started, probably November, December, I started going to my PCP to try and figure out who she would refer me to based upon some of the stuff that was happening. Now, like I said, that was 2019. Y'all know what it hit 2020. So yeah. it was a challenge to get to doctors because you didn't know if they were going to be open, if they were going to be loud open, vice versa, couldn't get an appointment. Like it was people were trying to still set up working from home that normally didn't work from home, like doctor's offices and waiting on the city. Because if you heard anything about um, COVID in the pandemic during that time, Dallas, Texas was on on every CNN. He would play... I th- I can't remember his last name, but Clay somebody. He was like the main person in charge and he didn't play. (laughs) And so he had some different rules than the rest of the country. But uh, yeah, so I started really getting symptoms where most people didn't have symptoms in the beginning, which was my lower body. Like like I said, my legs would go out. I would fall. I I would pass out. And then um my legs would uh just jitterbug on me and you like jitterbug like so I had one day oh and insomnia insomnia as well one day I was up because I was in pain and I couldn't sleep and I videoed it like one thing because I am an author I'm a speaker I'm a coach I'm a strategist and then in my church I'm also um well in kingdom I'm also an affirmed prophet so I pretty much communicate, you know, and I have my story from, you know, almost the beginning until still now. And so uh, I videoed it and I was like, this is not normal. Can you see what my leg is doing? (laughs) Right. And so they were like, is your leg shaky? Well, why don't you stop it? I said, because it's not me doing it. And they're like, what? And so I later found out that those were those um, little stinky, stinky little nasty bugs over there playing all up in my legs, the spirolectic, the parasites and stuff. They, I call them some bad names. I can't say it on the uh, podcast today. But I have some names who I call them. And my caregiver, she knows, and she'll be like, she's crazy. That she talks to them like they're real people. Because they over here acting like they're real people up in my body. I took residence, so I talked to them like they were ill. But um, so from about November 2019 until July 2020, I probably went to like seven or eight specialists, doctors. I mean, they sent me to get a sleep study. They sent me to get MRIs. They sent me to get, uh, gosh, what else? Uh, physical therapy they sent me to I can't remember what type of doctor is memory is also real bad for me (laughs) oh uh but he wanted to put things in my back like the shots and stuff because he was like maybe that's why he said maybe that's why you're in pain I'm like if you don't know why would you do something if you don't know like it was a procedure he was like well we need to try something so I, I canceled that surgery appointment um and I just uh really step back and I tell him this today and I tell her this today that that God used them to save my life my chiropractor um said Tanya I bet it's a bomb he was the one of the first person that identified it saw it but he's a chiropractor he's not an MD so I couldn't get 
what I needed, you know, as far as me medicines and, you know, st stuff with insurance, like they, they were going to just take what he said. And so, um, and the reason he knew about it is because a teenage boy had the same symptoms I had that was one of his patients where he was like, literally he woke up one day, he couldn't walk, his, his legs weren't working. He was like, tell you they found out he had Lyme. He said, tell you, I think you got Lyme. Um, it took it took him, but there's also my pain massage therapist. I tell her to this day, you are the only reason I'm able to walk because um, I, the best way I can explain it to people is, you know, if you like flex, like when you're doing a flex, I said, imagine your whole body flex like that all day long. I said, that's going to hurt, right? Like after a minute or so, it's hurting you. I said, my body does not know how to unflex itself. I said, then I have knots that are the size of boulders in them. I said, then I got swelling and inflammation of the joints and all of that, which most people, it was like, they say like their neck was stiff or uh, other type symptoms. Mine was straight my leg, my lower body, my legs day one. And so she helped me because if she would not have helped me then and still now, I really don't know if I'll be able to walk. Like how much the muscles were just so swollen and tightened and boulders and stuff feeling like, you know, they probably would have stayed that way because, you know, some arthritis, which they tell you another diagnosis you have is Lyme arthritis as well, or they call it osteoarthritis, something like that. I got a whole list, Kiara, like 25 different diagnoses that I got. People, they're like, okay, just tell me what you got. I said, I'll email you. <laughs> they're like, no, just, I said, no, I, I'm going to email you. You're going to be shocked. You're not going to spell none of this. So let me email you. Um, but yeah, so it took him getting me in to one of his friends, which was a, uh, I think he was a physician's assistant or an MA. He, he was, a, he had his own patients. Um, so you didn't have kind of like a nurse practitioner. You could, and so it took him telling him I was coming and you better figure out what's wrong with her. I'm grateful for how much they love me, by the way, over there at IC Wellness. I gave y'all a plug. But um, yeah, it took him calling that man and telling him, do not, you, you can't call me back until you figure out what's wrong with her. And so he thought he did, Tierra. He was like, oh, she has hypothyroidism and she has fibromyalgia and she has chronic fatigue. And I said, mm-mm. That's not, that's not, that's, I said, when I looked up in Dr. Google and I looked up what, what you said, I said, that's not explaining what I got going on. I said, that might be part of it, but that's not all of it. And he was like, well, and so it took another two months for me to convince him. And for once again, my doctor, my chiropractor to convince him to test me for a while. In that process, and while I was waiting, um, I went ahead, we went ahead and saw a naturopath doctor. Once again, she's not an MD, so you can't really take none of that to the insurance or your, your job for disability, they, they just not. And so, but she, she once again, saw me walk in and said, oh, you got Lyme. That was why I even went back into her office. And she said, and she used a, uh, I, I will probably get it wrong. Um, one of those electromagnetic machines where like you put something on you and then they'll tell you what they see in your body and your history, but it's not, it's electrical, something like that. I can't remember the name of it. In the process of that, I was waiting on um, my results from the medical assistant doctor. Do you know, one Thursday morning, Thursday night, Friday morning, I woke up at like three o'clock in the morning and I couldn't move and I couldn't talk. 
and I was scared because I had been in so much pain and stuff. Like, as soon as I came home, I told my husband, I didn't feel good and I'm going to lay down. And so he didn't want to wake me up. So he was in the living room, watch TV um, and stuff. And so he wasn't in there. And so I could not talk. So finally, I think I got enough strength in my in me. I found, I was like trying to touch all on the bed and I found like two remotes. I chunked one, he didn't hear it. I, it I'm not a good thrower anyway before long. <laughs> So I, I, I'm not mad at you, but I don't, I'm not a catch and throw. So yeah, the second one, he heard it, he came in and he said, all I could get out was call my mom. And after that, I had seizures, Bartonella seizures. It sounds like, so first and foremost, my heart goes out to you um, for everything happening during the pandemic time period. That's already an extremely scary time period filled with so much uncertainty for everything else on top of what you were going through. So I, I my heart goes out to you for going through it, especially during that time. Uh, then you add on, you know, the uncertainty and having to visit so many doctors and specialists and that doesn't even factor into the part of, you know, you having another chronic illness um, like endometriosis. And so I'm sure it was very easy to say, oh, it's it's got to be endometriosis, right? And thinking that that pain can be attributed to that, but it sounds like that wasn't the case. So can you walk me through perhaps some of the process of elimination that you went through with the endometriosis issue um, and how perhaps you were able to, maybe outside of what people had told you, what the specialist, the, the chiropractor um, had told you about suspecting Lyme, is there anything else that told you that that can't be it? I want to tell you why. I agreed with him that it might be it because it, I never he didn't once he told me and I told because he he's been my doctor for like six or seven years so he saw me with chronic endometriosis pain and stuff like that he saw in my same for my pain massage therapist she felt my body and what it was like when I was in an endometriosis flare so um that in addition to me telling him what was going on and i did tell y'all this part because at the time it didn't look like what everybody said um i am a woman of color guys so i know on the podcast i'm being, i'm a woman of color um and the crazy part is i turn red like i turn red but apparently a bullseye didn't want to show up on my body. So, yeah. yeah. And so in addition to that, it's why we believe I didn't get bit by a tick. I got bit by a spider. So it was just crazy stuff. Like it was those things. But um, I started when he, he told me that I traced back to the last, the only time that I can remember, I got it, it, and I remembered it. And the crazy thing is, we all remembered it because it was Labor Day weekend, and I tell you, my family, and we are from East Texas, the country. And so um, we were at a big family reunion, and I was standing beside my mother, behind my mother. My aunt, which is her sister, and some other cousins sitting around. And I said, ouch, something bit me. And everybody remembers me. This thing, everybody remembers me. And they were like, well, watch it, see, blah, blah, blah. And so I'm looking at it. Like, I took a picture, you guys. So when I go to my, like, the doctors, I have evidence of the bite. Like, <laughs> it's crazy. But it didn't look like a bullseye. It was red. It looked funky. Like it looked weird. But I always would react crazy to mosquitoes and stuff like that. Like I'm allergic to bees. I'm allergic to like wasps. So I always would re react differently. But it didn't look anything like what's in the books, what's on the internet. Uh, there's some there's some now dialogue about hey it may not show up as bullseye but 
you you read that after you told it's a bullseye. So you may it may take you a couple of months to figure that out. But um endometriosis and that's how I figured it out to answer that question. I thought it was my legs and it was endometriosis. No, I knew it was my legs and my lower body. And that's why I thought it was endometriosis because um I don't know how familiar people are with endometriosis, but uh, sometimes working out lower body stuff would trigger me into a full blown flare. So um, at that time, I was trying to be cute, you know, for, you know, trying to work out and stuff. And so I think I just thought I was in a flare. But then I went to my um, OBGYN, she's a specialist, and she was like, no. I don't think so. And then she even gave me some pain medication. It didn't work. And so I was like, I think it's something that's going on. And it wasn't that much long after me to thinking it was something else going on before I started the falling out and the fainting again. Like literally, I would walk. You, it was, it's supposed to be a straight line. I would literally fall, faint, or I would go like, Making a figure eight. <laughs> you know, I'm supposed to just go up straight. But it happened after I kind of realized like the pain and how it wasn't responding like it normally would respond. That was kind of when I started to do even my own research. My husband started researching and like we and just going to the doctor and stuff to try to figure out different, you know, to see what they could figure out. Because the diagnosis for the hypothyroidism, fibromyalgia, fibromyalgia came first. That was my PCP. And then the fibromyalgia, no, the hypothyroidism and the uh, chronic fatigue came after. So PCP said like January. Uh, the next diagnosis came like March, April. And I kept going back to, I said, there's something wrong. Can you test me? And so I had to beg him to test me. And then my doctor had to beg him to test me. And so the part I was going to tell y'all about the whole um, 911 scare, my mom flying, my mom made it to my house. She said like 15 minutes and she said like 45 minutes. <laughs> I said, oh my God. But she held me down still to this day. Um, but by the time we got home, my doctor was calling me and he was like, Tell you, I'm so sorry. That's all he kept saying. I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry. I'm sorry I did not believe you. He was like, Oh my God, you have Lyme disease. And I was like, It's okay. I was like, You know, we going to figure out what to do, you know? And so, um, the sad part next is he didn't he thought that there would be doctors here in Texas that would be able to help, especially in the hospital work. Well, there were two that were really ass doctors. They had just retired. One of them, he was retiring literally at the time I was getting sick and he wasn't taking any more patients. The other doctor in Denton, he had retired like maybe the year prior. So there were two just great Iliad's approved doctors, but they were retired. And so um, we were on the hunt. And so, Tammy, let me let me ask you to pause there for a second before you go further on your on your search for a doctor to assist you with your diagnosis and treatment. I'd like to go back and, and talk a little bit more about uh, first your endo diagnosis. Uh, and what was happening around there, and I, and I want to talk to you a little bit more about uh, about ticks and spiders and the and the various uh, bites that you may have suffered during the course of your life prior to becoming um, chronically ill and diagnosed with uh, with Lyme disease. So let's let's focus first on the uh, on the endometriosis issue. issue. Uh, one of the things that Matt and I have had to deal with as men interviewing women in many cases about women's health issues related to Lyme disease is that we've had to discuss endometriosis on a regular basis. 
And we've actually also done polls on our Instagram and we posted on Instagram about this particular topic and reposted on the topic as well. And um, if, if you ever want to see our Instagram light up, you should see when we talk about endometriosis, right? Because it really is a, it is a hot topic. And there are many, many women that we've interviewed and many women that we've interacted with on this podcast that believe that endometriosis is either caused or triggered by Lyme disease. So my question to you is, what is your reaction to the feeling that some women in this community have that endo is either caused or triggered by endometriosis? And is it possible that your Lyme disease journey actually started long before you were currently thinking about it and perhaps that it happened before you began your endometriosis journey? It was just presenting as endometriosis and you were diagnosed with um, with a symptom rather than the root cause of, of what you are now suffering from, which is Lyme disease. Endo and then just minorities, women, especially Black women, and when it comes to endometriosis and fibroids, um, we're not believed. We're gaslight, gaslit a lot. But um, luckily, in that regard, I've had amazing doctors. So I've, I'm one of... I'm of the few that actually were diagnosed based upon them seeing it in my body um, rather than just based upon symptoms. But I've been diagnosed with endo since I was like 18. Um, it's a family, um, you know, unfortunately it, it runs in my family. That along with fibroids and infertility um, as well as I have infertility. Um, so uh, I was able to understand my symptoms and, and figure it out real quickly because I knew my symptoms with endometriosis. And yes, I was originally thinking that was what it was because it started with my lower body, but never have I fainted, never have I, um, you know, passed out of different things like that as it relates to endo. Now, um, have I became lightheaded and dizzy because I also have another uh, disease that is in the black community, which is sickle cell. I have one of the sickle cell traits and I present uh, with full blown uh, episodes, unfortunately, as well. But I, I, I knew enough to know something more was wrong. And I could check the box or rather X off what that symptom was to know it wasn't endo, um, it wasn't coming because of endometriosis. And the pains are different. I don't know if any of the other um, guests have said that, but the pains are completely different for me. I don't know how, how or why, but endometriosis pain and Lyme pain, at least in my body, um, they don't feel the same way. They they hurt, but they don't. They're not the same way. Um, hopefully, that answered your question about how I was able to figure it out. Um, the next thing I will tell you, though, is we've been going. My family is from East Texas. We've been having family reunions for fifty five years, and even before that, they just don't have a record of them. And so I've been going to East Texas for 40 years. So I was a little girl, um, probably maybe first or second grade. And I had got rushed to the hospital. Why don't you build that out for us? What that hospital experience was like? And then we'll talk more moving forward about maybe that is giving us some clues into what was happening with your health as you were beginning to get older. I had a crazy, what they assumed was an allergic reaction, and they they were never able to figure out what it was that caused it. And from all I know, and I remember is that they told me to always carve my sit up in, in case I enter, it comes again and um, have an epipen. So I don't remember a lot. I don't think my parents remember a lot or much just 
sit either. Most of my um, issues, even as a little girl, um, not a little girl, but I was like 12 or 13, when I first had my cycle, um, I passed blood clots. And that was the main thing that was always the issue for me from 13 all the way till I got diagnosed with endo at 18 is that I would pass blood clots and um, found, finding out that I uh, was a female and had one of the sickle cell traits. But outside of that, I really wasn't sick that much like the other siblings were um, with asthma and things like that. Um, but remembering like specific things of the illness or the hospital incident, I don't, I, of course, I don't remember. No, I, I understand, Tanya. So, but, so one of the things that, you know, we often think about when, um, when folks are trying to like pinpoint a diagnostic window or a symptom window is that, you know, Lyme is rarely a disease that becomes a chronic disease from an acute disease, meaning rarely do you get a bite and then become chronically ill um, because that's just not this, that's not what most doctors are observing in the community. For example, when we interviewed Dr. Rawls, he said the only time that in his career he had seen someone go from bite to chronic illness was if someone's living in a high mold environment, so they're immunocompromised because of the environment, or if they suffered multiple tick bites at the same time and then would become chronically ill. In a situation like yours, where you had seemingly one bite and then got sick would be rare. It would be more likely that what's happening is your body was harboring the bacteria and the, and the viruses and the protozoa that were in your body from a prior tick bite, Mm -hmm. um, and then what happens is there is some kind of a immunocompromising event or some high stress event, and it could be your endo developing. It could be it could have been issues that were going on with um, with uh, you know your your sickle cell traits, or it could have been other events in your life coming together to stress your body and stress your immune system so that you couldn't fight off the the microbes any longer, and then you then you begin to suffer this 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 chronic illness. So. Outlining this process the way I've outlined it, do you think perhaps that might be a more likely path to what had happened with you? Um, I do know, like I said, we we thought back about that incident and said maybe that was the tick bite or spider bite. Um, but what I can tell you is just it was an extremely stressful time. We, we my entire family, we had just had like eight to ten blood relatives that died in one year before COVID. And so I thought I was going to pass, I like not pass it, I thought I was going to be having a breakdown like because one of the people was my sister. And I, and sorry, I didn't know she had breast cancer and she told, she told me. That her numbers were because you know they rang the bell and so she rang the bell but then she told me like a little bit after that that their her numbers are still showing that she has it has something but they couldn't figure it out and so i didn't it's not that i didn't think anything of it but i'm like okay well she, they working on it you know but looking back i think she knew the last six months because she started doing specific things with me, one of which she told me to um, take care of my niece, which is her daughter. She said, I don't need your help. I need I need to know that you have her. And I was like, yeah, like, what are you talking about? And, um, you know, she had me doing other things as far as her business. And I was like, why are you trying to do all of this at one time? Like, you're going to go. She didn't answer me. But I still wasn't thinking then at that time that was what was going on. And we'd had conversations about death and, you know, being there and how, because uh, the year prior, my mom's sister had passed away from cancer, lung. She, we knew one week. <laughs> and she, she, one week. Um, and I told her, 
it took everything out of me to be there because I never experienced my mother lose it like she did. And so we, and she said the same thing about her adoptive mother as well. So which I think she didn't want me there, any of us there, cause she didn't want us to see her go and be in the pain. Um, cause she actually told everybody to leave. And so I'm still thinking, even as she, the day she died, they called me, told me, hey, she said come tomorrow. She told them to go home. And between shift change, y'all, she died. And I was like, no, for real, like I'm coming up there in the morning. And so I didn't get to say bye. Um, then 2020, February, my granny passed. But that time, I said, I'm, I don't care what time it is, I'm staying. And so I was the last person to be my granny before she passed. It was like an hour, maybe or two after I left that she passed. And so do I think that I was under a lot of emotional stress and duress? Absolutely. Um, there were other situations that legally I can't talk about as well that were going on. So yeah, oh yeah, I, I definitely know stress probably um, induced it because I know stress already had a factor with endo like that was one of the things i had to manage with endo is my stress level and so um it, it just wasn't working my managing of it yeah um, well, and, 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 and who could do the work i went to do the work though even before i knew it was live i went to do the work i um i uh checked myself into um in outpatient because there wasn't any inpatient therapy and i was in therapy for a good minute like that's yeah so i'm still in therapy but just with my therapist but i knew i needed to walk through the process of getting to healing and restoration um clinically with uh that christian uh side of things as well so i i did do that on my own. And that was even before I had got the um, that Lyme diagnosis. So let me talk to you a little bit more about Lyme disease before, before Tiara takes you through the rest of the journey that we, that we paused that with you, you locating your doctors and your treatment mm -hmm. plan. Uh, I'd like to know what you knew about Lyme and ticks and, and tick diseases prior to that chiropractor telling you, Hey, Tanya, you may have Lyme disease. So Remember I told you we lived on the East Coast. So that's what many other doctors kept telling me. Oh no, you probably got it there. I didn't. I know I didn't, because I was fine. Um, we lived in Virginia. We loved going hiking. We still do, but we were already always cognizant because my mother-in-law and my father-in-law are ex ex were not ex retired military. So they were knowledgeable about ticks and Lyme and all of that. And to, you know, wear uh, layers, wear long sleeves. Um, my mother was like, cut, she was like, um, cover your hair, and your head, and then check and stuff when y'all get back, you know? So from living in Virginia and my in-laws, I learned more about Lyme and ticks and different things like that to know what to look for. And so, um, and we still, you know, he, there's some parts of it in Dallas, Fort Worth that have trails and stuff here too, but um, I don't believe any of those were what triggered maybe or reinfected me. But yeah, um, I, I first got um, knowledgeable of it um, in Virginia, when we lived in Virginia, Hampton Roads area. Okay, so now why don't you share with us now your journey from when you you got your diagnosis? Tell us now, and, and Tiara's going to take you through the doctors. But I want to know what was your reaction when you when you finally got this Lyme disease diagnosis? I mean, your spirit was telling you that you had Lyme. The symptoms were matching up for you when you were doing your research on Doctor Google and other places. I mean, did was did you have this sort of feeling of euphoria? that you finally had this this diagnosis and you know the gaslighting would stop or did you have another feeling what was, what? 
if, did you hear me? I was like, uh, no, no euphoria. Because I was like, dang, here come another chronic illness. For real? Like, I'm just being honest. I was like, oh, why Why you give me two, Lord? Like, I, that's what I said in my head. I was like, I already had one. And that was already hard, you know? And I was like, now I got a second one? Like, okay. Um, got to put your big girl pants on and figure out what you need to do and, you know, work through it. And so, yeah, I, I was, I wasn't, I was, there was no euphoria. There was, you know, some sadness, some frustration. And then it was like, okay, now you need to figure out what you need to do. And that's pretty much what we've been doing ever since then, you know. It hasn't been an easy journey, but I'm still fighting literally for my life every day. Yeah. Well, during that process, it sounds like you went through many different, first of all, let me just say too, you've had several different doctors. It sounds like try to help you and advocate for you in this process, including your chiropractor, kind of being the, the starting point of this journey of figuring out what's happening with you. Um, so I'm curious to know, um, how many doctors did you end up going through with the gaslighting, with the, you know, figuring things out as far as what was going on? How many doctors do you think you probably went through before you kind of got to this point of really, truly having a concrete diagnosis? I'm laughing. My care gave it to my too many. <laughs> <laughs> oh my gosh. Um, before I got a diagnosis, I think it was probably like eight. Eight eight or 10 before we got a diagnosis. And then once we got a diagnosis, we went through about three more. Okay. Okay. So when you, so when you got the diagnosis, then what happened as far as the starting treatments? Because I think everybody kind of goes through their journey and honestly, what works for everyone is not the same. So I'm curious to know kind of what your journey was as far as what you started with, with treatments, um, where you ended up with and had some success. Well, we found out that there are no doctors in Dallas where we're at that treat Lyme disease. Wow. And we literally, I mean, we're getting sent to all these different hospitals, to their infectious disease department. And they're like, we don't treat Lyme. I'm like, it's an infectious disease. We don't do that here. Um, I mean, sending referrals to clinics. They're like, why did they send you here? We don't treat Lyme. Finding out the only, going and signing up, I think it was an Iliads or one of those websites that gives you uh, the search engine only to find out the list is old because the two doctors that were near me are retired. Um, I would literally cry when I talked to the one that was actually retiring. I was like, he won't just see me, please. Like, he don't even have to take care of me, just see me one time. And she was like, I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry, but he is not taking on any new patients at all. And so it took from December to, I mean, not December, July until I think September before I finally got an Iliad LLMD. <laughs> and we drove five hours there and five hours back. Oh. To get to them. Um, he's since retired. Love him to death. Um, he's a man of God as well. Um, but he just retired. Um, yeah, a fit, finally he retired December, but technically he retired before that. But he was keeping me on until I found a new doctor, which is now one of the only ones in the state of Texas that treats Lyme. I want to say there's only two LLMDs or three. Now there's functional doctors and there's naturopath doctors here, um, but there's only two or three LLMDs here in the state of Texas. As big as Texas is, it's just crazy. Um, 
And so luckily I got some of the best ones, my doctor that retired. Um, most people don't know that uh, George Bush, the son got infected as well. And he was a part of that team um, when to treat him. And then my new doctor uh, is, was, is mentored in, by Dr. Horowitz. So gives me some reassurance um, in, the, in that regard, um, to say the least. But um, the next thing you, you kind of wanted, what some of the things I've done, path and tried. Yeah. Yeah, so now that you kind of have found your way in terms of finding an LLMD in a state where it sounds like they're far, they're far and few between, um, where did you guys start as far as treatment um, on that entire journey and where you are now? So I'm going to use, uh, dang, they both got the same initials. <laughs> I'm going to use Louisiana. Okay, so Louisiana, we started with... Uh, what is it? Uh, Rifepin, clarimethamycin, is that one of those? Azithromycin, and then uh, I had an IV one. Um, I don't remember what the first one was, but the second one was vancomycin. Um, and then we were also, um, from uh, Thick Horowitz in, no, Rawls, his protocol, um, we went to our um, health store and got many of the um, uh, supplements that are a part of Rawls protocol. And so we were doing both. And we pretty much still, um, even under the, my Texas doctor now, um, we're doing kind of this approach we were doing on our own. That's pretty much what we're doing now. But um, we were under that path with um, Louisiana, probably two years um, of antibiotics and then some other uh, meds that treated some of the symptoms like Remember my leg issue, so I had restless legs, and um, I don't know if anybody else had this, y'all. But I, and I, I don't feel no, sh I don't feel no shame. I was scared half to death. I had night terrors, and I could not sleep because I kept seeing uh, the the devil in different stuff and different things in my house, and I was like, I can't, I can't, I can't do this, and so. Um, he, he um, we changed up some meds and then he added some because he was like some people do have night terrors from it and so you're one of them I was like I don't ever want to experience that again so um, early on we were just kind of with the treatment um, we were figuring out some of the other symptoms that I had that I didn't realize I had because I was just in so much pain I couldn't think about, I, I couldn't bear anything else. Um, we, methylene blue, which is um, out, no, is kind of in their community and known. Um, so we did methylene blue, so um, I didn't really, fingers crossed, I didn't really have issues with yeast. I'm like, fingers crossed, I won't do it. Uh, I didn't really have any. I know a lot of people just said they they do in the um, community, but I didn't. Um, what else did we try? Like I said it was at least. Oh yeah, so we also my carrier was reminding me of that. So while we were talking to our Louisiana doctor, we incorporated a functional doctor here, and he's known in the Lyme community as well. Um, Cause he doesn't treat. Well, he did not just treat Lyme. He taught, um, he treated cancer and stuff as well. Um, he wasn't a naturopath. He was a functional. Um, maybe y'all can explain the difference. I just know functional is they incorporate 
both, but they also still have a medical di um, doctorate and all that. And um, he passed away. It was so in the middle of the treatment, he passed away. I, I couldn't believe it, but one of the treatments, which is some of the stuff that they do in Arizona and at Limestop, uh, IV therapy, not IV, uh, what is it called? Um, ozone, no, no, not ozone. Pick is one. It ozone therapy? So they took a bunch of my blood out, they added oxygen, and then they ran it through uh like it's not a not a laser i can't think of what it's called but they ran it through that and then um put it back in me i don't I, it made me feel worse <laughs> um but i did probably like 11 or 12 sessions of that but it it just made me feel bad. It didn't make me feel better. They thought it like they were like some Lyme patients and makes them better and um, you know decrease symptoms. Not me, not at all. Um, so we did that. Uh, we 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 kind of pretty much tried a combination of traditional um, meds and then we tried some uh, kind of I guess what do you call that? Uh, alternative medicine yeah i'm sorry the memory is bad and i saw a psycho um oh my a psycho therapist as well i've seen so many no i had so many tests y'all it's crazy i've had um the one where they monitor you and your seizures i had that done like three or four times i hate it that's part of the reason why i don't want to go to the hospital ever again so I had that where they like watch me and monitor my seizures. I offered them to say they're not epileptic. I know they're not epileptic. I told you that. Like you, I know that. Um, but because they're not epileptic, not epileptic, they, uh, they said they're not seizures. They're episodes is what they said that they should be called, and that um, they're only happening because of stress. And I was like, oh, okay, sure, thank you. Um, we had that testing. We had probably, I think, an MRI, an MRA. We had probably like three or four of those. Um, gosh. It sounds like you got put, uh, put through the ringer trying to figure out things from a treatment yeah. perspective and from a testing perspective. Yes. And it kind of makes me wonder out of all of the different modalities that you have experienced in terms of treatment. Um, I'm curious, you talked about a little bit about a functional doctor, you talked about some alternative medicine and combining that um, with you know, medicine. Did you notice much of a, a difference or have a preference when it comes to, you know, some of the alternative stuff that you experienced and then some of the conventional medicine you experienced? So I will tell you guys. I don't necessarily feel that I got results with some of the um, alternative treatments. And I say that lightly because it may have been that I needed to, they, they didn't judge that maybe later in my treatment process it would have helped i think maybe that also attributed to it um but i was in too much of a chronic state for there to actually be um for it to be effect effective so i do feel that way because like i said when i did the ozone therapy they were like oh you should be in less pain and, blah, blah, blah. and literally i felt like somebody ran me over for the, like the next day, but I think it's because of the sickle cell trait. You took all my blood out. <laughs> I don't think you thought about that and what that would do to me when I'm a, a person that's already anemic, you know? So I, I don't, you know, stuff like that. I don't necessarily uh, think they thought it through of, you know, the treatment may be the best. Um, yeah, I mean, that makes sense. 
that they it sounds like they didn't consider it and one thing too um that i've heard from a lot of people and even my own journey is a lot of different treatments i mean it feels as though it's not working right because mm -hmm. your symptoms have increased mm -hmm. your pain has increased whatever your symptoms are um and sometimes that can also be attributed to a herxheimer reaction meaning that you know the the bacteria or the pathogens are being killed off faster than they can be eliminated by the body and so that's why you see a lot of people doing coffee enema, supplementing with glutathione and other things to really help their body a little bit so that they feel a little bit more of that relief. Um, so it's hard to figure out what's actually working um, when you feel worse, you know, because it could very well be working. It's just, it doesn't feel like it, you know? Yes. Um, and, I, and I will say the only reason why I said that about that is because to your point, I have had that where it is, I know it's working because, it, you know, they say, um they often tell us in the community it's going to get worse before it gets better you know the symptoms and so i've had it but that those that feeling literally just felt like i was having a, a, a sickle cell episode that's how it felt so that was why i don't think it was really helpful in that regard but some of the other things acupuncture um i actually did acupuncture before because of endometriosis so I was familiar with it. Um, I only saw, I, she had, and I believe she had great success, but I just don't, I don't like, like I said, I just don't know if it was the right time in my, my journey to take it. Cause I had it before and it, and it worked very well. Um, we also recently did, um, we were doing colon therapy. Is that what it's called? Colon therapy. We were doing that um still put pain massage therapy which she incorporates the lymphatic you know drainage um foot detoxes um i have an infrared sauna in my home um probably if you name some stuff we probably at least try to work <laughs> we tried it one time or so um yeah and then the uh what is it the different IV concoctions in the bags and stuff like that. Um, we've done that. We're actually starting it back up now. So like the blue thion, um, we just started that like a couple of weeks ago. Um, hydration kits, we just started that. Um, and we're actually supposed to be getting um, the Myers cocktail too. Surprisingly, the insurance, I think is gonna cover that. So, some of like i said some of the things that either they said in the beginning or um we tried two two years ago was trying again now i'd stopped methylene blue under my louisiana doctor my texas doctor added it y'all tara i have to tell you i counted i take like 90 pills a day it that like that just it took me like it took so much in me to convince myself that i could do it because i was already taking a lot already and to see how many like it's his protocol and treatment plan is so uh scary <laughs> It's scary. Not that I'm scared of the work. It's just like, oh my God, can I do this? Like, I had to hype myself up for like a week to, if I delayed it, I say, let's wait a week. You know, I'm telling caregiver, let's wait a week. I, I, I'm not ready yet. You know, <laughs> this is a lot. And so, um, I don't know how I do it. By the grace of God, but I get through it because everybody in my family has said to her, I would just have to die. I said, you just gonna die. Like you gonna give up. God they call you out. You know, but they're like, I can't do that. Uh-uh. Like, cause I still get IV meds and stuff like that. They're like, I can do it to myself. Uh-uh. I can't take out the medicine. I'm just gonna tell God to me how. Well, let me ask you then, what, <laughs> what you this journey is so there's so many twists and turns. There's yeah. I mean, you find out so much about yourself, about your own strength and tenacity. So what is it that keeps you going, especially when you have all those other people in your family saying, girl, I don't know if I can do this. What, what keeps you going? 
them, the same ones that say they can't do it is the same ones. Like, we praying for you. We we got your back. We here for you. I'm like, oh, so you got me, but you not going to do it. So, no, we're not. But uh, definitely, uh, like I said, I really have a, not even a village, not even a tribe. Like, it's a lot of people praying for me. And, you know, literally it'll be them and then they'll tell their friends to pray and so like my mom just ran into uh one of my uh uh the white the first lady of I, the church i grew up in when i was little and she she was like tell her she can't even imagine how many people are praying so, and I was like, okay. um and, and i believe that because um they just didn't support with their prayers they they pay for stuff um they donated um they they rock my my wear my my line wear and, and support that way um so you know they they really um let me know i'm not in it by myself and a lot of times i need that when i'm in the dark of night in the middle of the night crying and praying or uh like i was all weekend up to still even today just in pain sick just feeling like crap you know but i know i have a purpose and um i definitely resonated with um matt when he was talking about that that's that is my assignment um that i tell people um my assignment is to help you to see that you're able to figure out how to fit it all together the puzzle pieces of life my assignment is to show you and help you how to do life and leadership unapologetically on purpose and so why not me why why not I, why wouldn't he choose me um from my pain and make it all gain. You know, why wouldn't he say, this is what the enemy tried, but I'm gonna make it for your good. And I'm gonna give you an opportunity to um, share your testimony. And I do hope to also um, become an advocate, especially um, for minorities to um, be a voice. Because like Matt said, if, you, if you're not aware of it, you would just think it's a white people disease. I'm not trying to be mean or funny, but like ignorance, you would think that, but it's not. You know, it, anybody, any color, any shade of the rainbow can get it, you know. And so I, I definitely want to be a part of some of those conversations as they extend um, in those uh, governmental and um, congressional forums and different things like that in the future to have a voice um, where. I stand up for my people um, as well, but it's my assignment. Let me say to you as a fellow woman of color, I appreciate your response. Um, and I'm I'm not making this about me, but I want to say the journey to figuring out the purpose of why this all happened to you is so hard. Mm -hmm. uh, and and I've gone through the exact same thing. I've had the nights of crying. I've had the nights of like, why me? And I had the exact same realization of i'm doing this and i'm going through this so that i can advocate for other people who don't have the voice i'm doing this so that the knowledge that i've equipped myself with i can provide to other people and also like you mentioned being a person of color you truly do not see as many people going through the same thing either that or maybe perhaps they just haven't been given the right platform right mm -hmm. um be a woman and or the right uh, diagnosis yeah it, 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 that's the thing and so i I appreciate your response so much um, because I myself had to go through that. <laughs> I can't even tell you how many times I've gone over it. I mean, even in my episode, I was crying, right? Um, it's the hardest thing to conceptualize why this was put on in your particular path. Um, and to this day, I mean, I even had a couple of nights before just crying because it's like, this is rough, but you are the beacon of hope for many people like like us right um but but everybody as well um who don't have the ability to 
have the voice to advocate for themselves when it comes to medical representation. Um, you are a huge voice and I, I really hope that you know that. Um, I just had to make sure that I said that to you. Um, I wanted to ask, you know, being that you are that person who wants to advocate, what does that look like for you um, in the future as far as advocacy for Lyme, for chronic illness? What does that look like? Um, I don't know. Yeah, um, when I say I don't know, I don't know um, even how to get there, but I do know that I'm doing things now. One of which is um, I, on my platform, and then just period, I communicate things and give uh, guidance when you're going outside or like if you're going to be in any type, I say it's not just the tree, it's any little tall grass. I say, you know, it's a field everywhere in Texas. They take pictures when the wildflowers grow in Texas because of Lady Bird Johnson. I just like, if y'all take one more picture in the weeds, y'all gonna be the guy something. Y'all be taking no pictures. <laughs> but I'm serious because that little bit of wildflowers and grass that's grown up because they don't cut it when it's, it's against the law. So when the wildflowers grow at Lady Bird Johnson, they, she, um, seeded throughout Texas, they're not allowed to cut that grass. And so however high the, the wildflowers grow, that's how high the grass grows. And you see people on the side of the road, the freeway, stopping to go get, walk in the field. And I'm like, don't do that. Please, no, please stop. Please stop, please. I'll give y'all background. And you know, just do something different. Um, communicate, you know, just about what to do. You know, if you're gonna go out hiking, especially to like there's a real popular one we're about. We we're about, you know, tell them uh what to what to wear as far as long sleeves. Um, ladies cover your hair up, especially as black ladies. Um, we got a lot that we work with we were added. Um I tell them about the spray, you know, because um, everybody knows about off with deep, but there's one specific one, I think it's on Amazon, that's specific for ticks. It's a little bit more pricey, but it, you, you'll be protected. Um, so I do a lot of that communication, and I also just do a lot of um, symptoms, you know, because uh, a lot of people, they sometimes just want to know what is my life like or what is it or what what should they think, look at what because like I said I I truly believe um that that is probably uh there is probably more minorities that have it but because we get gaslit more we don't have the necessary insurance to where we have are able to go advocate and fight for ourselves. We're, we're only Medicare, Medicaid, and there's one doctor, and they're trying to see 20 people in five minutes, you know, so they're not really listening to you, you know, so I do believe, yeah, that there's more minorities that probably have it. We didn't get to half a million, uh, and that's just the ones that are counted, do cases a year overnight, you know, it's the, it's the same, spider that bit me is still in East Texas. That means he bit some more people, you know? So yeah, um, I, I, I try as much as I can to communicate, advocate, and just make people aware. What I would hope, like I said, maybe is, you know, to get a part of one of the congressional forums so that there's equal dialogue, you know, across all races. Um, I do, uh, you know, hope, you know, this opportunity. I was so excited when they reached out. I was like, I've been following y'all since I got, oh my God, like I was so excited. I was like, yes, yes, I get to talk to my people. Oh, so <laughs> this was like very like top of my list, like exciting for me um, as far as what it looks like going forward in advocacy. Um, you know, that's part of even why I came up because I am, like I said, I'm an author, speaker, coach, strategist, and prophet. So I have like my own regular line of what I call message apparel. 
but I ended up doing it for myself because I wanted to just like wear something, you know, related to Lyme, but a message about Lyme and, you know, faith, hope, stuff like that. Um, and so I would just did it for myself. And then other people were like, well, we want one too. And when you, and they're like, um, and use the money for your, um, your bills and stuff like that, you know, do it that way, you know? So that arm of things is kind of how it started. And I just, you know, think about something and I ended up, I end up making, making a design, you know, I think one of the ones we have right now that's popular, it says healed. And so healed is either like in green, lime green or white, like whatever. Um, head up, faith up, hold up, believe it, period. You know, that's the for things, but that's just in its own way, it brings dialogue. And the reason I like to do it is I want that same message in my business with my books. Somebody may never come hear me speak. They may never come um, buy a book. They may never, uh, you know, want to do coaching, but they want that cute shirt, that, that nice shirt with a message on it that they resonate with. And so I took that same thought process and applied it um, for my line. I call it my no line, um, please fundraising that I do for myself. But um, I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm an advocate and I was always an advocate for other diseases before this. Um, my grandmother, she had Alzheimer's. And so um, we would do the Alzheimer's walk. My mother-in-law has MS. Um, now my little brother-in-law has it. No relation. I have to tell people that. They're like, oh, her son? No, it's no relation. But um, we did. We would do the MS walk for them and donate and, and um, participate um, in breast cancer as well. So there's different things we've always um, had a heart to give and to serve. That's that's pretty much something my dad taught us very early on is that we're not here by accident. We have a purpose, we have an assignment. And if we're not doing what we're supposed to be doing and in the place where we're supposed to be doing it, then somebody's missing out on what we're supposed to give and do. So we gotta be acting on purpose all the time. And so, um, yeah. Well, it sounds like you were you were raised with advocacy in your blood. So I I have no doubt that moving forward you will continue to be an advocate for Lyme and and other um, chronic illnesses as well. And um, I have no doubt that you'll continue to use your voice effectively to be able to bring awareness to help people kind of guide their their journey and 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 perhaps make them a little less less fearful. Um, yeah. I know we talked a little bit about kind of the final question, if you will, and the fact that you don't know what it is. Um, <laughs> um, but I wanted to ask you, you know, throughout this entire journey, I feel like there's so many twists and turns, so many different chapters, mm -hmm. subtitles, right? Um, so what did you learn about yourself on this whole journey? Because I think that's what it is, a huge learning journey for everyone around you, for yourself, um, and, and, and for your medical team too. So what did you learn about yourself? Um, that God still wants to use you no matter what state you're in. And if you allow him to use you, which you're giving him your yes, he'll take care of not to wrong, but he'll take care of the rest. And so for me, it's just been a continual yes. Yes. Yes to you will. Yes, you wait. Yes, I don't understand what's going on. Yes, I'm crying and I'm in pain. Um, but yes, I'm gonna go, I'm gonna get up here and 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 speak or pray. And you're not even gonna realize I'm sick because God's hand will be on me during that time. And then the grace will leave and then I go back home and get my chair. <laughs> but yeah, it's just, I just, I, that I'll continue to give him yes. And, and whatever state that I'm in. That's, and somebody was like, it's not 
yeah, it's not that big deal. It, it, no, it really is a big deal when you don't know if you're going to live, when you feel like you're dying, when you want to die. Like you, you got, you have some real conversations with yourself, with other people, because well, you might have to get put on suicide watch. They might have to uh, watch, watch you all night. Make sure you don't do nothing to yourself. And it happens. And in our community, the Lyme community, it happens. Many people kill themselves. Suicide is a real thing because they don't feel like there's help. And then they're told there's no cure. There's only remission and who knows how long remission will last and how much it costs you to get to remission. And so hopefully it lasts, but if it don't, what you gonna do that? You broke like you 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 know and you learn all these things in this fight. But if you still wake up every day and say, Yes, you you are you 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 are doing your part. You are doing the part that as human beings, as self, that you're supposed to do. Give them your yes and crying, sad, bloody, angry, bruised up. Because I, I get, that's why I was like, why well, don't got a bullseye? Because I bruise up very easily. That's what I was hoping to y'all for real. I'm not lying. I'm still to this day don't understand. I bruise up all the time. But anyways, but yeah, just just yes. I I've I just realized that that's all I, I know to do because it's not meant for me to, to to give up in this. It's not meant for me to not fight. There's nothing in me that will stand by and let me give up on myself and give up on God. So I owe it, not to people, I owe it to me. I owe it to my future. I owe it to my promise, the promise that is over my life, the things that I wanna see and do and experience. Like, I can't give up yet. What? Tanya, I, I can't thank you enough for saying yes, not only to supporting the community and saying yes to so many of the other things you're saying yes to as an advocate, but saying yes to us and to blessing us with uh, your beautiful story and blessing our community with sharing all that you did share with us. And I also have to thank uh, Tiara for saying yes to uh, agreeing to co-host with me again because she was brilliant as always. Uh, so uh, I want to thank the two of you very much. and. And, and Tanya, I have, um, I have one more request for you. Could you just share with our listeners before we wind down um, where they could uh, contact you and where they could locate your apparel because your apparel is just unbelievably well done. And I think <laughs> there are a lot of people who would love to uh, who would love to uh, gain inspiration from wearing your apparel if you were to share where folks could uh, could locate that apparel. Absolutely. So. On social media, you guys can find me under Talking with Tanya, T A N Y A. Um, my website, tanyajmiller.com. You will have all the links, but the direct link to the uh, No Lime Please Message Apparel is bit.ly, um, No Lime, and bit.ly, No Lime Please. But if you just go to my website, tanyajmiller.com, um, the store link is on there too as well. And you can see um, everything that's out there. And um, yeah, let's let's all, you know, claim our healing, show and believe that we're healed and keep our faith and our hope up. So thank you for that opportunity. And thank you. And I thank the, the double T's, Tanya and Tiara for blessing our listeners with this great podcast. <laughs> thank you very much. Absolutely. Thank you guys. Thank you for listening to our Tick Boot Camp interview with our guest, Tanya Miller. To our listeners, we have a call to action. First, if you'd like to learn more about Tanya Miller, visit her Instagram at Talking with Tanya. Second, if you've enjoyed this episode of our Tick Boot Camp podcast, please share it with your friends on social media. Third, 
Tick Bootcamp has created a Tick Bite Blueprint that has been inspired by the information that has been shared with us by past podcast guests. We encourage you to visit our website at tickbootcamp.com slash bite to view the blueprint. Fourth, don't forget to subscribe to this podcast on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, or Spotify to get your automatic episode updates of our Tick Bootcamp podcast. Please take a minute to leave us an honest review on your podcast platform of choice. And finally, if you'd like to search our podcast library of almost 350 episodes, subscribe to our email list or share feedback. Please visit our website at tickbootcamp.com. Thank you as always for listening.